morning. Um, I see many different classes represented here today. Um, some of you are learning about World War II and the Holocaust. Some of you are studying religion, and politics. Um, some of you are in my writing classes where we've been reading Mouse and the Giver. Um, and all of us at the St. Andrews community are grappling with ethical decision making and making meaningful lives. And today we have with us two very special guests, um, Mr. Hal Hanauer Myers and Mrs. Nora Myers. Um, Mr. Myers lived through one of the darkest periods of human history, and he's going to share his story with us today. Um, in the Jewish tradition, memory must be accompanied by action of ethical and moral intent. As we hear Mr. Meyer's story, we should reflect on the issues of ethics and morality, the same social problems of racism and pre prejudice, hatred and bigotry exist today. And we will all have to make decisions about how we will respond. Today, we will become the receivers of memory, and we will have to decide what therefore shall we do. As Mr. Myers prepares to give his presentation, I do ask that you turn your cell phones off and stow them away. Um, they've come a really, really long way to be with us this morning, so we want to be respectful and uh, give them our full attention. And afterwards, there will be a, a chance for some questions. Um, so please uh, welcome Mr. My Myers and give him your full attention. Thank you. Good morning. I'm delighted to join you today to share my experiences during the Holocaust. I was born in 1930 in Karlsruhe, Germany, the capital of the state of Baden, near the Rhine River which flows along the French border. I lived with my parents, an older sister, and a younger brother in a modest apartment. My father had been a soldier in the Kaiser's army in World War I and was very proud of his service experience. Therefore, he was not concerned with the changes coming around him in the early 1930s. He sold radios and appliances house to house. My uncle sold cloth, and on occasion I was invited to go with him to the surrounding villages in an ox cart with bales of cloth and back. I remember fondly our weekend trips into the Schwarzwald, the black forest. On Sunday mornings, we boarded the tram that went into the hilly mountains of the woods. I can still hear the ding, ding, ding of the tram bell. The silence of the forest was overpowering after the noise of the city. However, with the passage of the Nuremberg Laws in 1935, my father was stunned and quite helpless. Jews lost their citizenship could no longer travel on business, attend or teach in public schools or universities, or practice medicine. They could not hire non-Jewish maids or speak to non-Jews on the street. Jews became non-persons. Money was tight when my father lost his job as a traveling salesman 
because of the travel restrictions. Our hikes in the Black Forest also ended. My mother arranged for us to move to the Jewish Community Federation school building. Mom ran the kitchen, Dad did the cleaning. We had no toys, but played on the nearby castle grounds. The chain link fence was our swing and the statuary our climbers. I also remember when Adolf Hitler came to Karlsruhe for a state visit. The evening Hitler was to speak, I was allowed to attend as long as I was home by dusk. I witnessed the madness. The town went nuts. Hitler's personal guard, the stormtroopers, some on horseback, entered the city with marching bands also on horseback. Huge German flags with swastikas were everywhere. There were high banners with spotlights on them. When I returned home, we could still hear the noise of the rally. The Germans adored their Fuhrer. With little money, we were blessed that mother was a marvelous cook. She baked the traditional challah bread on Sabbath and a tart that I was delegated to carry on two trays, one in each hand, to the bakery down the street, which had ovens big enough to handle the, pan, the large pans. After 1938, that trip became rather exciting and frightening because the local boys would chase me and yell, run dirty Jew. I never did lose the trays. <laughs> In order to make my trip to the bakery less hazardous, I begged mother to buy me a pair of short black corduroy pants like those worn by the Hitler youth. I felt this would create some question in the minds of the boys who were chasing me. I hoped that some would think I might not be Jewish and might be a member of the Hitler Youth. It worked, sort of. I was chased about half as often. In 1938, my 12-year-old sister was selected to leave Germany for England on the kinder transport. Great Britain accepted about 10,000 Jewish children for refuge from the Holocaust during a two-year period. The transport stopped when it became too dangerous for ships to travel to England so I never had the opportunity to join her. November 9th, 1938 was a night of broken glass, Kristallnacht. I awoke hearing strange noises downstairs in our apartment. My brother and I were sleeping on the top floor under the eaves we looked out the dormer window and saw men with cans of gasoline going into the synagogue next door. We saw flickering lights in the windows. Then flames shot up and shortly went out. Since the Nazis were unable to get a good fire going inside, and next brought the Torahs and prayer books out, throwing everything in a pile, 
poured more gasoline and set all afire. That night, our apartment was totally trashed. Windows broken, furniture thrown out the windows, cabinets upended, glassware broken, dishes all over the floor. I was heartbroken when I realized that my one prized possession, my Montpont pen, was missing. The Gestapo took my father outside. Not knowing what to do, I joined my father. Get out of here, he hissed. Run. Go to Aunt Anna's. I made my way, passing Jewish stores with broken windows, with their merchandise spread over the sidewalk and the street. People were taking as much as they could carry. When I arrived at my aunt's, she told me that my father was taken to Dachau, a concentration camp outside of Munich. We stayed with Aunt Anna for several months while mother labored to put our apartment back to living order. My aunt's apartment was not attacked because they lived above the apartment of a non-Jewish couple. After many months, father returned a changed man, having lost half his weight, afraid of his own shadow. All he wanted to do was eat and lie on the sofa and sleep. The winter of 1939 was brutally cold and snowy. We had little result of little food as a result of the British blockade. In 1940, England began bombing Karlsruhe. Everyone had to build a bomb center we built one with an armored escape hole into the driveway and had food and water there for several days. The British flew over night after night and we heard the rumble of the bombs and the whine with an ex escalating screech before the crunch of the bomb hitting its target. Before 1942, Hitler wanted to deport all the German Jews to every country that would take them in. He conquered France in 1940, which meant that France had to accept the Jews from Germany, the states of Baden, Hesse, and Württemberg. After 1942, where is this? Hitler decided that he would have to eliminate the Jews. Therefore, in 1940, we heard a pounding on our front door. Mother opened the door to find two big policemen and a Gestapo man in, a, in his black uniform. They announced that we were to pack suitcases for each of us, adults 50 pounds, children 30 pounds, no more than we could each carry. We were, were to take rations for three days and not more than 10 marks each. They said, they would return for us in one hour, and they returned, marching us out of the house down the Kaiser Allee toward the railway station. Non-Jewish people were watching this procession, hanging out of their apartment windows 
on both sides of the street. There was absolute silence. Gestapo agents and their prisoners came out of the side streets and added to our sad procession. Our neighbors made no attempt to assist us. The elderly Jews among us were in particular trouble because they were being pushed to keep up with the main group. There were more than 900 people in our deportation. We were kept waiting for hours at the station before we were loaded in fourth class carriages. The doors were locked behind us. I was scared, but my parents were quite stoic. During the train ride, no one was permitted to leave the train. The three-day train ride was a nightmare. The folks on the train had not heeded the instruction to bring three days rations and water. There were armed guards along the, tra the train at each stop and no one was permitted to exit the train for water or toileting. The toilets on a train soon overflowed all over the train floor and ran into the corridors and began to smell and smell. Of course, the windows were locked. We finally arrived after three days in Oloron, France. It was raining heavily and we were escorted off the train into open trucks with our soggy belongings. After a short truck ride, we arrived at the concentration camp, Camp de Gers. The camp was one of five camps that were built by the French to handle the refugees from Spain during the Franco Civil War. They were recently vacated, stood empty. The men and women were separated into subcamps called ELOs, the children going with the women. We struggled through the rain and deep mud into ELO K, a barbed wire enclosure with about 40 tar paper shacks. The shacks were empty except for a pot bellied stove in the center. But there was no paper, wood, or coal, nor matches to start a fire. After a sec selecting a shack that seemed to leak less than the others, mother sent my brother and me into the other shacks to see if there was anything useful to scavenge. We found three wet wood, three wood bed frames and some straw filled mattresses. One for mother, one for Aunt Anna, and one for my brother and myself. It was a relief to get out of the rain and the mud and just sit under the roof on the wood floor and relax. Mother volunteered as a cook in the kitchen. We was out in the open. Turned out to be a grand idea because it got us some extra food. There was never enough food for everyone and people were starving. With mother in the kitchen, we could get a slice of dry bread, some brown sugar, which when heated under the kettle above the open fires, turned into a caramel cookie, which was delicious and filling. 
anything extra was a blessing. This was the only time in my life when I was skinny. Mother insisted on cleanliness. We had to wash in the outside tubs daily. There was only cold water right off the Pyrenees Mountains. The water came from snow runoff. No matter complaints, daily washing was going to be. We were ragged, we were hungry, but we were clean. The paths were narrow, some unmarked. They were surrounded by areas of deep mud so deep that every day elderly ladies who strayed off the paths were actually drowned in the mud. The areas around the barracks were a sea of mud. It was easy to have your shoes stick in the mud. When you tried to get them out, you might fall into the mud, and then you had to wash it all off. It was easier to take the shoes off and hang them around your neck and walk barefoot. That saved the shoes, but the mud was very cold in October. The facilities were horribly primitive. The bathrooms were in the back of the ELO, 75 yards away on thick, gooey mud paths. To go to the bathroom, you had to go to the three tubs in the rear so you could do your thing. Once at the tubs, you climbed a set of about 12 sticks, steps. There was a stick across one of the, of the tubs that you balanced on if you needed to sit. Meanwhile, the wind blew. There was no cover at all. This was totally exposed. Each morning, a hand cart pulled by two men came through the camp to collect bodies of old ladies who had died in the mud overnight, trying to get their shoes, or fallen into the tubs trying to balance on the rod. It also stopped at the infirmary to pick up several who died overnight. But this was all unintended savagery. Gers was not a death camp just a concentration camp. Mother had no time for idle hands. We had to wash the family clothes, dry them on lines set up for that purpose, sweep the barracks and dispose of trash. We helped in the kitchen where we kept wood on the fires and removed ashes. The Quakers, an international human, humanitarian organization, had an office in Toulouse not far from Gers. The Quakers, with Alice Resch in charge, became aware of the appalling conditions in the camp. She was particularly concerned about the children. She obtained permission to provide them with hot oatmeal and a glass of condensed milk every morning. Alice Resch was determined not only to feed the children, but to rescue them from the camps. She recruited the head of OSE, Ouvre de Secours des Enfants, a French Jewish organization that worked with children in need. 
the two women met with Pierre Laval, the vice president of Free France, and obtained a letter authorizing them to remove children from the camps, providing that they would be fully responsible for these children for the remainder of the emergency. Alice organized several convoys of children from the camps. She needed permission from the parents, and my parents were among the first to sign permission parents, papers. I was put on the second convoy of 48 children as a substitute for a boy who decided at the last minute that he could not leave his parents. Therefore, I was listed as number 48. I still have a copy of the transfer order. Recently, I saw my name on that list in a book. I was shown here in North Carolina. The youngster whose place I took ultimately went to the gas chambers at Auschwitz with his parents. I joined Alice and 47 others. We were transferred to an orphanage near Toulouse, France, where the Quakers had made arrangements for us to stay. It was called the Maison de Pupi in Aspet, the province of Haute Garonne. We arrived late at night and taken to showers in the basement, supervised, showered, deloused, given a blanket, and sent to bed. Boys on the first floor, girls on the second floor. Our clothes were returned the following morning, all washed. It turned out the director was very concerned about having lice in his fine establishment, as my mother had been. Alice lived with us for the next 30 days while we were quarantined. We were always kept separated from the other children in the orphanage, so we could not contaminate them. Alice slept in the room with us younger boys, setting up a blanket around her bed for privacy. Alice was loving and gregarious. She frequently took one of the younger children into bed with her until they went to sleep. We crowded around her and she kissed us all, as she would come to do each morning and at bedtime. Alice taught us French, English, algebra, and French customs. We learned French songs, which I still sing today. All of our activities were surrounded by the magnificent Pyrenees Mountains. We hiked the mountain meadows. We formed an intimate relationship with Alice. Having her with us made us feel good and wanted. She and I had a special relationship, and she always, under her dying day, at age 96, referred to us as her children. A miracle happened in 2000 when we were reunited with Alice after 59 years, but that's another story. She still referred to me as our brave little Hansel. She is credited with saving hundreds of children, is honored at Yad Vashem Memorial in Jerusalem and the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. It turned out that I was in the orphanage for only six months. One day in August 1941, Another miracle happened. The director called me into his office and said, you are going to America. 
I asked if others were going with me, and he said I was to tell no one I was going, that he would inform them later. I rushed to pack my few belongings and did tell my best friend Carl and ask him to keep it quiet. The director put me on a train the following morning for Toulouse. I had directions not to leave the train until someone from the Kramer, Quakers came to pick me up. The train arrived at the huge Toulouse train shed and I waited and waited and was so hungry but no one came. When the conductor finally chased me off, I found a cab driver out that outside the station and said, Quakers? He pointed in the direction across the wide canal. After walking block after block, I was lucky to see a small plaque reading Societe Quaker. You can imagine how relieved I was. I entered and was soon surrounded by three Quaker leaders who had no idea who I was. They finally found a telegram on Alice's desk telling of my coming arrival. Alice was on vacation, so the telegram had gone unread, and therefore I had been abandoned at the train station. I spent the night in a local children's home where I had hard, crusty bread and French cheeses. I was in heaven. The Quaker set up a guardian angel to escort me to Marseille the next morning. I stayed in a transfer hotel in Marseille for about a week as the unaccompanied children going to the United States gathered. When we finally left Marseille on our way to Lisbon, our train went through Oloron, where the train stopped for a few minutes so we could wave goodbye to our parents. We could not leave the train. Through an open window, I got a quick hug from my mother. She handed me a little black notebook, lots of tears. Little did I know, I would never see them again. During the train ride to Lisbon, we enjoyed good food with real butter. After a week in Lisbon, we boarded the SS Serpa Pinta, traveling to the United States via Casablanca and Bermuda. The freighter had a lower deck fitted with bunks from floor to ceiling, so we were about six bunks high. Our chaperones had done lots of planning. We had assigned bunks and lockers. Unfortunately, I was ill, seasick, the entire voyage on the freighter, which was sunk on its return voyage to Europe. However, once on this trip, I felt like I was on a great adventure. I recall seeing the Statue of Liberty in New York Harbor. I was finally in America. I had made it. I was apprehensive, but optimistic about the future. Whatever it held for me, I was ready. Can you imagine that in a very short time, I went from traveling by ox cart in Karlsruhe to riding my new foster parents' Cadillac in Cleveland, Ohio. Unfortunately, I learned late in my life that my parents were cast in the Auschwitz death camp. I am one of the lucky 1,200 unaccompanied children 
that were able to start a new life in America. I was truly blessed. Only 1,200 children were allowed to enter the United States between 1935 and 1945, in contrast to almost 10,000 kinder transport children that entered England in a two-year period. You can read the ex excellent book, Roosevelt and the Jews, which discusses anti-Semitism in the United States, particularly in Secretary Hull's State Department. Thank you for your kind attention. Holocaust survivors, Hal buried the Holocaust deep inside of him until the year 2000, when one phone call changed everything. A lady who was writing a book about the children in Vichy, France, contacted Hal. When he described his experience, she said one of the ladies who had worked with the Quakers was still alive in Copenhagen. Throughout the years, Hale had nurtured the dream of someday locating the Quakers in order to repay them for saving his life. He immediately called Alice, who remembered her brave little Hansel, who went alone to Toulouse and was lost. Shortly after the phone call, we had an emotional visit with Alice in Copenhagen. We said we wanted to do something very special for her. She asked us to publish her autobiography, which we have for you today. However, we suggest that you never volunteer to publish a book that had to be translated from Norwegian to English. <laughs> it was a many year challenge. After working with the Quakers in Philadelphia, we brought you the results of the project, the book that Hale describes as written by his angel of aspect. And we'll leave this for you um, if you'd like to read it. Now we'll uh, open it up for questions. The older sister and the brother, what became of them? Yes. Well, my sister was four years older than I am. And she died three years ago in the United States. My brother brought her over to Cleveland. She was in an old folks home for the last couple of years of her life. My, my brother unfortunately passed away from a heart condition two months ago. If you don't mind, I'm gonna to add to that because I don't think that answers your question. Um, as you, as Hal said, uh, Ruth was brought on the kinder transport to London. Um, and they placed the children in various uh, schools, orphanages, or with home with families and homes, whatever, wherever they could find placement. Ruth lived in England for uh, many years and then came over to America and lived in New York with an aunt. Um, she had a very different um, 
relationship with the Holocaust than did Hell. It, she would say that not a day went by that she did not live the Holocaust. She became secretary of the kinder transport and they did meet up until very late in her life annually either uh, in London or in New York. Um, Hale's brother was taken out on the first transport out of Gers. Uh, the uh, Quakers did not see the relationship between the two brothers, so they were not kept together. Um, his brother's name is Dieter, and he was put in another camp, Rivasol, very near Gers. It was, a, it was the same type of um, camp that, that housed the um, Spanish refugees. Um, the same organization that saved Hal's life was also working in Rivasol. And the boys were reunited in Marseille before uh, the trip to the United States. To this day, um, Hal does not know how they reunited the brothers or how they were so fortunate to get to the United States. Uh, the children from the um, concentration camp who were rescued by the Quakers, um, went, many went to Israel. We have been to Israel several times visiting um, the uh, people, the kids from, from uh, Camp Tiberius. But they really, we have several in this country and they're, they're living throughout the world. In early 2000, we organized a reunion with all of the children that were still alive in Copenhagen with Alice. Uh, it was a much publicized reunion in the uh, press, the local press in Denmark. And it was really um, quite an experience for these elderly grandparents <laughs> meeting together um, and not having seen each other from their, their childhood. Alice was just an incredible force. Even when we first met her, when she was 92, you could see how she was able to do what she did, which is really remarkable. She took kids over the mountains into Switzerland. She took them into monasteries, into nunneries. Uh, it's, it's, it's quite a story. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Did your father ever speak of his experience at the town? Never. Never. He was a broken man. Whatever the Nazis did to him, they did it thoroughly. Another question? What were your parents' names? Hmm? My father was Frederick, and my mother was Hedwig. Hanauer, H-A-N-A-U-E-R. I was Hans Siegfried Hanauer. <laughs> story how he became Hal Myers, but as he would say, that's another story. <laughs> Are there other questions? How old were you when you came to America? How old were you when you came to America? I was 11 years old, and my brother was nine and a half. I had the opportunity of um, going with Hal to retrace his childhood in, in Germany and in, in France. And um, I don't know if, if any of you have ever been in a European railroad station, but my um, vision of it was certainly dramatically changed when we got to the Toulouse uh, railroad station. And if you think how protective we are today of our 10 and 11 year olds, uh, and you think of this kid being put on a train with a foreign language, and the train sheds are absolutely humongous. Even to this day, if you travel by train in Europe, 
you are in just these, they're called train ships, but they're absolutely huge. And it was quite extraordinary to picture an 11-year-old um, talking to the cab driver. And Hal had told me the story, but until you see it, um, when the cab driver pointed in the direction of the Quaker building, um, I thought, well, crossing the street. But what he had to do was cross a boulevard, go across a huge canal, a bridge, then cross the other side of the road. So I thought it was just an experience getting to the other side of the, the street. Uh, and we, how he found the Quakers and their little building, uh, I, I think is extraordinary. Um, it was just a little plaque on a very old building. Anything else? Yes. Have you, have you ever been able to I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Have you ever been able to forgive the Nazis? Well. Did you all hear the question? It was a, may I repeat your question? Um, have you ever been able to forgive the Nazis? Well, I wouldn't want to be with I wouldn't want to be with them in any way, shape, or form. Let's start with that. <laughs> I didn't mean to be funny, but I don't trust him because <laughs> um, it's. Um, I was surprised. He had a, a page that he did. He chose for some reason not to read to you. He had a, a, a page in which he just very briefly. Uh, tells about the history of, of Germany and the rise of Hitler is really um, a very powerful story. And I think um, we've had the experience of being with other survivors. Up until the late 1900s, uh, about 1990, late 1990s, um, I think you all know the name Steven Spielberg, but I don't know if any of you have heard of his Shoah project. Does anybody, you've heard about his Shoah project? Steven Spielberg will say it's the greatest thing he will ever do in his life. Um, he uh, decided, that, that was the time when Holocaust deniers in California came forth, and he decided that he would find all the survivors he could possibly find, all the Holocaust survivors he could find. And what he did is he sent trained interviewers and film crews to interview all the Holocaust survivors. And he has a um, library in which he has these um, videos. And I don't know how, what he's doing with them worldwide, but I certainly know in California they are in the schools. And he sent um, a crew up to our home. And when they arrived, I said to the interviewer, you really are giving our family um, such a rare opportunity to, to hear Hal's story. I said, isn't that absurd? Can you imagine that the family really doesn't know the story? Uh, and she said, we hear that everywhere, everywhere we go. And really, since 2000, there has been um, so many books written, so many stories. It just opened up the floodgates for the, um, for the survivors. And their stories, everybody has a different story, uh, one sadder than the next. But certainly, the horror of what they went through, I think it would take a most amazing soul to say, I forgive. And I have not met any survivors who are able to say that. Anything else? Have you returned to any of the camps in Germany? Did you return to any of the camps? Have you seen any of the concentration No. Um, no, I haven't had the... Uh, I haven't had the strength to do that. That takes a lot of strength. He has uh, gone back to Germany on um, 
several occasions. I think one of the messages that the Holocaust Speakers Bureau uh, in Durham and Chapel Hill, where Hal is, is a speaker, um, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, oh, yes, I was going to talk about um, They, some have gone back to the camps. We did, uh, Hal took me back and we did retrace his childhood. And it is quite extraordinary because we went to a small town, Freiburg in southern Germany, um, to see his family's uh, homestead. And when we got to um, Eichstätt, um, outside of Freiburg, we had a guide with us because Hal does not speak any German. And in this little town, we went to the um, courthouse. And Hal had a very small picture of the family home. We showed it to the uh, clerk and asked if the house was still standing. And she said it was, and gave our guide some directions. Our guide was having some trouble following the directions, and we came across two women who were standing on the corner uh, talking to one another. And the guide approached them, showed them the picture, and there was absolute silence. And, and it was if, if they had no idea how they could answer her very simple question. And it turned out that that woman lived in the house that we were looking for. And her hesitation was such that um, she feared that we came back to claim her house. And once she realized that was not the case, we did go in and we visited with her. We also visited the cemetery. And I had never been very big in visiting cemeteries. And I really didn't understand why people spend so much time reading gravestones. But I did that day. Uh, we went into the Jewish cemetery, which was gated and very well cared for in this very tiny community. And we read the gravestones. In 1938, there was not another gravestone. It all cut off in 1938. And there were no Jews. In our, in where we traveled in, in, um, in Germany, there were no Jews today, though there are uh, some, particularly in, in, in Berlin. So we have, he has retraced his, that's kind of a convoluted answer to your question, but the point is that he has gone back and we've visited because um, Hal speaks a great deal in the schools and um, he's spoken in prep schools and inner city schools and it's very interesting to see the questions that the kids have. They are a little more energized on the subject. Uh, particularly of the concentration camp. They can't get enough of the blood in the door. Um, Amanda? One more question. Um, you question is, with all hell has been through, uh, and certainly coming to America as an 11-year-old, that's a, that, as Hal would say, is another story. Um, how did you manage to um, survive in a, in a healthy way and, and, and have a successful life um, because of your past? All I can tell you is you take it day by day. I went into school, the fourth grade, and the kids were very understanding of this little fella who was speaking German and didn't know any English. And they corrected my English. And the teacher came to our house in the afternoon and gave us English lessons. That's 
I don't think Hal can really answer that question for you. I would say that um, the kids who went through the concentration camp, and it, it was only 1,200 that came to America in that 10-year period. Uh, the um, State Department was not really interested in taking the kids, and it's quite a miracle that even in that 10-year period they took as many as 1,200. Um, we happened to be at a conference uh, that was organized by some, several women to find as many of the 1,200 kids uh, who came to this country. We met in Chicago, probably early 2000s also. Um, and it was an extraordinary weekend. Um, I had said to Hal, I, I can't sit through three days of Holocaust. And he told me not to worry because the Art Institute in Chicago was across the street and so was Marshall Field. Um, and I'll tell you, I didn't move for three days. It was absolutely extraordinary. And to answer your question um, would be to tell you about the strength of those kids who were grandparents then, but who, who had come over. Um, I think one of the reasons they were able to survive, I can't speak for all of them, obviously, but certainly many of them. Um, when you see the horrors of when you're 10 and 11 years old of dead bodies every day, um, your brain um, develops a um, ability uh, to not react. Um, you, these kids were at an age when their right brain was developing, and they really, many of them, as in Hal's case, don't have much of a right brain at all. They're, they're left brain. So that means that um, they, they're not emotionally connected as you and I would be to the horrors. And the reason I brought up the, the convention in Chicago was because it was absolutely overwhelming to see the number of scientists, physicists, left brain people. And we um, heard one of the guys had just received uh, the award from New Jersey as the most outstanding citizen of the year. He was a professor at Rutgers and as a physicist. There was one from Dartmouth. There were medical people, all very left brain, so that um, Hal does not react in the same way I might do emotionally to something that is a dead disaster, such as a death or a death in the family. Does that answer your question? Maybe more than Hal would like to have me answer it. Anything else that we can? Okay, Amanda. And by the way, Hal was a scientist too. He uh, was a, uh, a chemist, a chemical engineer. So if you would just uh, thank you to...